So what I'm going to do is just to start off by uh, sharing uh, some pictures with you. And um, this is this is something that some of you may have seen today. If you were looking up into the sky with your uh, eclipse glasses on at around uh, 10 or 11 o'clock this morning, uh, we had a partial eclipse of the sun. Uh, we had quite a bit of cloud up in uh, the Tyne Valley where I was, but I did manage to get that picture. And um, for me, it's just a reminder, even today, that we live in not just an Earth, but in a world and a universe that is full of wonder uh, and, and amazing um, mystery and amazing beauty and amazing complexity. Uh, isn't it incredible that um, the sun should be 400 times further away than the moon, but also at the same time, 400 times exactly larger than the moon, so that when they appear in the sky, they are pretty much the same size. Uh, and, and that's quite remarkable. And as my son was pointing out to me, actually, the moon's is slowly over the millennia moving further and further away. So actually, we're fortunate at this point in, in, in Earth's history to have the moon just the right size to, to create eclipses like this. And uh, as you'll know from one of the Psalms, the heavens declare the glories of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So uh, if you were able to see that, or if you see pictures uh, on the media of the eclipse, it's just a reminder that we have an amazing creator. Uh, about three weeks back, I was on a pilgrimage walk with uh, some Anglican bishops, and I entered this particular uh, forest, which is uh, just off the Tyne Valley. It's, um, it runs along uh, a valley of a, a, a river called the Devil's Water. I'm not quite sure how it got its name, but it's, it's, uh, it's much more godly than satanic. It's, it's a beautiful place. And, and something new struck me for the first time in my life. I, st I, I started praying in a way that I'd never prayed before. Because I realized as I was walking through this beautiful stretch of woodland and, and looking at the, the fresh spring leaves on the trees and the spring flowers on the ground, that nature itself is part, obviously part of God's creation. And nature itself declares the praises of God as, as that Psalm that I've just quoted tells us. But also maybe nature is, is giving itself in prayer to, to, to its creator. We don't hear the voice. Uh, of, of the trees. We don't hear the voice of, uh, of the flowers, but we see their witness. And uh, it just so happened that I was praying the Lord's Prayer at the time. And Jesus says, pray in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was when I got to that bit, on earth as it is in heaven, that I started praying very mindfully with creation, with nature, and, and not as just as, as something that's somehow separate from nature. Often we, we think of ourselves as being over and against the rest of creation, but we are part of creation. We are part of nature. We're part of this, uh, this earth that God has created. And so I re-prayed the prayer um, from the perspective of creation, that, that creation hallows the name of God, that creation cries out and groans, says Paul in Romans 8, for, for the kingdom to come in its fullness, for God's will to be done in the whole of the earth, in all of creation, in all of the environment, just as it is in heaven, for everything to be in harmony, for everything to be living well together. Um, give us to this day our daily bread, praying that, that all of creation will have the sustenance that it needs to survive, particularly, obviously, those endangered species. Uh, and, and then when it got to the forgiveness, then we as humans have a lot to uh, confess and to ask the rest of creation to forgive us, if you like, or certainly ask the creator to forgive us what we have done in uh, uh, all the different ways we've polluted and disregarded this wonderful world that God has given us and share in that forgiveness that is maybe received in, in return and praying that nature, that creation will be spared uh, the very worst of the evil that could yet happen. So I don't know whether uh, you'd like to do this with me now, but I'll just pray the, the Lord's Prayer very, very slowly line at a time and you might just want to think of uh, the way you've encountered nature maybe today if you've been outside or, or, or on a holiday recently or just think about what's around and think of this wider creation praying this prayer with us as I pray it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, our trespasses, as we also have forgiven our debtors, those who trespass against us. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For yours are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 So, that's an opening thought. I'm going to now hand over to Dave, and Dave is um, our, our guest speaker for tonight. So Dave's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the Baptist Union Environment Network, maybe a bit about, uh, uh, well, whatever God's put on your heart to share with us tonight as we gather. So thank you very much to Dave for joining us, and you're very, very welcome to be with us today. Thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks for putting this evening together. Really appreciate that. Um, is it possible I can share some slides? Could you enable slide sharing? Certainly. Thank you. There you go. OK, so it's, it's great to um, be with you uh, tonight and um, thank you for, for, for coming. Um, I, I seem to have spent more time in the last um, eight years up in the north uh, east than I've done for most of my life. I'm 60 on Sunday. Uh, and apart from uh, a visit to Newcastle University when I was 17 to see if I wanted to do my degree there, and I nearly came, but not quite. Um, I hadn't really come up to the to the northeast for for a long time. It's a long way from where I have lived for most of my life, which has been um, kind of in the south of of England. Well, I originally come from Nottinghamshire, um, but um, on my last on my first sabbatical in twenty thirteen, I found myself walking from Lindisfarne down to Hadrian's Wall uh, over a couple of weeks, and and. Uh, loved the the scenery the wildness of the coast and the moorland up there but um and then i've been coming up to durham quite a bit in the last um seven years as well uh, i'm part of a project at st john's university called equipping christian leaders in age of science and i've been coming up there for meetings and seminars of various things and then i was glad to come up when i was president a few years ago to stocksfield and i i got to to An I think up to Annick, and I think I did call in at Heaton as well to talk about Messy Church, um, the science. So um, thanks for uh, coming tonight and sharing. Um, I know there are some of you in your association who have been great champions of the environment and climate over the years. I see David's Goldings with us tonight. And uh, um, I hope, uh, you know, Buen is giving some new energy to um, this work that has been going on amongst the Baptists and amongst um, with BMS as well uh, with their partners uh, overseas. So we, Buen is the Baptist Union Environment Network. We launched it last September. We've been kind of working on it for uh, um, maybe nine months before that, a year before that. Uh, it, it kind of grew out of a smaller uh, group of uh, people who had had this long engagement with the environment and climate amongst the Baptist churches. And we just had this idea that maybe uh, we could have a wider network of drawing people uh, together. And, and uh, as I say, we launched in September uh, 2020. We were delayed a little bit by COVID, but we, we did a virtual launch in the end. And our aim is to kind of increase awareness and uh, to network people together amongst the Baptist Together movement uh, to have a concern about the environment and the climate crisis. My, my background before I became a minister um, 20 years ago was I used to work at the Met Office and the Hadley Centre for Climate Research and I, I developed weather forecasting and climate models so you can believe everything I'm about to tell you uh, tonight, well at least for the next six hours. Um, so um, I, I used to sit in seminars and see pictures like this not quite in this format, but I, I, I used to see these from the mid 90s onwards. This is, uh, this is a depiction of the Earth's temperature from 1850 to 2020. 
and it's like a barcode, but each stripe is a year and it's color coded according to the temperature of the planet. And it was clear from what we were seeing in the 90s um, and even before that, that the planet had been warming over um, the last 150 years. You will have seen lots of this on, on the TV. And, and the scientific consensus was that uh, this was caused by the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This year, here we hit the milestone that there is now 50% more CO2 in the atmosphere than the pre-industrial era. I have to say, I, I, I sat in some of those seminars uh, with a little bit of trepidation actually hearing about this because I grew up in the Nottinghamshire coal fields and our entire local economy was, was about mining coal and burning coal and selling coal. And lots of my family and friends were involved in, in the coal industry, as were many people in the, the Northeast as well. Um, but with our climate models from the 1990s onwards, we could make predictions of what was going to happen uh, in the future. And um, it presents us with some choices. Um, if we carry on like we are, like we have been doing, we'll more than double the CO2 in the atmosphere by the end of the century, and we'll end up with probably a five degree warming of the earth. And the overall consensus is that is dangerous, both for human life and the wider ecosystems of the planet. Um, the research says that uh, it would be much safer if we could keep the warming to two or 1.5 degrees. Uh, I say safer because there are still consequences uh, for that and we are already feeling the consequences of that both in this country and uh, particularly around the world in the, in the developed world and in the global south where the phrase climate emergency is not just a campaign slogan it's actually a, a reality as as bad as covid um, and in many ways nations around the world have started to respond to this somewhat slowly and following the paris uh, climate accord in 2015 nations have had to start saying how much they will reduce their CO2. And it's going to be a big topic of conversation at the G7 uh, summit in Cornwall this week, and also in the, the COP UN climate conference in November in Glasgow. At the moment, we're likely to see a three degrees rise at the end of the century, which is still too large and will have quite dramatic consequences for, for life. Now, I've, I said I sat in seminars about this in the 90s, and I've kept up to date with the science, and I've been talking to churches about this through the noughties and through the last decade. I have to say the, the predictions of the temperature rises hasn't changed, just our confidence in the science has grown to the point where we can say this is, this is likely to happen. Um, however, that's not changed attitudes and behaviour, and knowing facts uh, doesn't necessarily do that. And maybe that's a mistake those of us who are scientists made. We assumed if we told people the facts, they'd sit up and take notice. But over the last two years, and eight, two years, there's been a kind of sea change in public perception and attitudes, I think. It started, I think, back in 2019 when Greta Thunberg arrived on the screen. Uh, and the uh, student climate movement and the strikes erupted. You know, she famously uh, told um, governments, you know, your ha our house is on fire. And I know what she means, it is getting hotter. It's already one degree hotter uh, now. And then of course, bigger figures like David Attenborough have recently got on board in championing the issue of climate change, saying it's the, it's the, uh, it's the greatest threat in a thousand years. Um, the temperatures are rising much more rapidly through the ice age cycle. The, the last 10 years have been the warmest on record from um, the uh, observation to the political process and to governments are making commitments to reduce carbon emissions and switch away from fossil fuels to, to hopefully more renewable sources of energy, although there's debate about what energy mix that we, we need. So with this change of uh, public perception and political movement driven by lots of different factors, it seemed to be a good time for us to raise this profile up amongst uh, the Baptists, the uh, Baptist Together movement. So when, uh, exists to inspire and enable the Baptists 
together family at all different levels from local church to associations to the colleges to the to the national teams to support our life uh, together by the way um yeah so that's what we're trying to do to work at all these different levels um we're trying to help the church to recognize the goodness of god's creation i, I love that picture that uh, paul uh, put up of the eclipse earlier uh, i've got a similar one on my facebook page tonight because i i managed to take it we had a break in the clouds here and i managed to get a pair of old eclipse glasses and put them in front of my mobile phone and take a picture uh, of the eclipse and i've already had 50 people like the fact i said isn't isn't creation wonderful and marvelous um and and so we want to try and help the churches and christians recognize the goodness of god's creation because we can some we've often missed it we put it in some of our hymns but then we've kind of left it there uh, i think actually the covid experience a lot of people have started to reconnect with their environment and nature and begin to recognize the goodness of it um we want to help churches recognize that um, caring for creation is a core part of our mission I mean, the Anglican Church actually have this as one of the marks of their mission, caring for creation. But we want to kind of recognize that actually by engaging with these issues, we're, we're actually working with uh, God. We're sharing his heart and sharing his concern. This is part of God's mission that he is sharing and inviting us to take part in. And thirdly, we want to work for justice, for creation and for people who are already dramatically being impacted by the issue of climate change around the world with uh, heat waves and fires, with droughts, with increased hurricane strength and, and storms and floods. So there's some of the aims of um, Buen, that's some of our aspirations. And really what we want to try and do is take the issues of the environment and climate and, and they've often been on the fringe of our thinking as a church we might have an occasional event in church life or or some prayers in church life um, but we want to take that uh, theme and that concern and kind of weave it through some of the the key priorities that we have as as a as a group of churches nationally so these are some of the key areas that have been identified by the baptist union council over the last few years pioneering planting thinking about how we reconnect with some of our communities in new ways having a voice in the public square um, raising our voice and campaigning and expressing concern from a christian point of view equipping local churches for mission and and shaping leaders for the future in the church and i hope that we through when we can influence each of of these areas i think we've already started to do that in the last year um we um in march at the baptist union council um agree investments coal car tar sands oil and gas and uh, we were stimulated by this by a bright the bright now campaign of operation noah uh, a christian environmental charity and this will uh, give us a stronger voice when we uh, are speaking to with our brothers and sisters in other faith uh, communities in other christian denominations and beyond it will strengthen our voice i think as we as we work with partners overseas with the baptist missionary society as we share some of their concerns uh, about uh, the environment too we uh, want to influence the new ways that we're doing church i've i've been reading some material about pioneering and fresh expressions recently and uh, this is one book i read on a, uh, my recent sabbatical this year called rewilding the church and and this is a book which uses a lot of language about the environment uh, and what's called rewilding let it to return back to its natural state um, to explore what it means to be church uh, and to connect in with this but i actually think we need to not only rewild the way we talk about our church structures and our mission and the way we are church together i think we need to rewild the way we think about doing church where we think about gathering together in our churches how we um, we travel to church how we uh, heat and light our buildings um, but also i think uh, the issue of the environment is a, an opportunity to connect with people in, in new ways with with the gospel too i think uh 
we need to think about how the environment connects in with that core gospel message we have of what happens at Easter. How does that relate to some of these concerns? This is, I think, is a, a Celtic cross. I took that picture in Rothbury when I was walking St. Oswald's Way back in 2013. I love the way the Celtic cross has weaved together creation imagery with, with, with the cross. And uh, Eco Alpha, by the way, is, is not a new alpha course, sadly. It's actually an environmental consultancy in um, California. But I think we need to think about how these issues are woven into how we speak about discipleship and uh, how we uh, equip leaders for the future in thinking about these vital issues uh, uh, as part of our mission. And another key area for us for our mission is actually connecting with younger generations, children, young people, the millennials. This is a, the cover of a recent Tear Fund and Youthscape report, which um, talked about uh, the, the anxiety and the concern that these younger generations have over climate change and the need for us to listen to their voices and perhaps let their voices take a lead uh, as we think about their future uh, because they will feel the brunt of climate change for uh, for longer than than some of uh, we will um gradually we've been um talking to churches and uh, leadership in our associations across the country and many of our associations now have small uh, what we call in buen hubs uh, people with a concern for the environment and climate from local churches who who want to share that concern with the wider networks of the association i'm speaking with you tonight uh, next wednesday we've got the launch of buen midlands which uh, is a, a, a partnership between heart of england association and the eastern uh, association and we're having a very similar meeting to this next Wednesday night for that middle part of the country. And it's been really encouraging to see how uh, the leadership of our associations and um, the local churches in the association are starting to to engage with this in, in, a, in a wider way. Um, what we've tried to do in this first part of Wen's journey is uh, point uh, people to things they might do as we lead up to the UN Climate Conference in November this year, which has been held in Glasgow. It was delayed from last year. So what we've been trying to encourage churches to do is to think about getting involved in the Climate Sunday initiative, which is uh, run by Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, which encourages churches to hold uh, one of their worship events um, before November to emphasize the um, issue of climate change. Um, sorry, I'm having problems with my screen for the minute. Um, emphasize the issue of climate change to their, sorry, I've messed up, um, to their local congregations. Um, can you still see my screens, by the way? Yes, Dave. Hello. Hello. On to the um, uh, the um, uh, the main um, menu, so we could just see the uh, the image with all the the menu of the other images along the side. Okay, sorry, I'm, I've. Somehow... If you could get it onto slideshow again, then then it'll. I'm, I'm, oh, I can see you now, Paul. That's fine. Hang on. Sorry about wouldn't, this. Wouldn't be Zoom without a technical hitch. It wouldn't. Uh, I can't get it back on the slideshow. Do you want to exit and then come back <laughs> in again? Hang on, let me stop sharing, see what happens. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I've done. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yes, but as it was just before, so we got the... Uh, I mean, it'll still work for us, I think. So you just carry on. Okay. Worry about so we're, we're encouraging churches to hold a Climate Sunday event. Uh, Climate Sunday encourages churches to think about signing up to a Russia's Eco Church scheme, which basically allows uh, enables you to do a kind of audit of church life, and and uh, think about how you can reduce your carbon footprint. And um, And also uh, to sign up to what's the, called the Climate Coalition Time is now declaration, which calls upon the government uh, to um, work closely, uh, work towards uh, reducing the carbon footprint of the nation and switching to renewable energy sources. Um, 
I'm not sure. I can't see my PowerPoint at all now. So <laughs> it's moved on to one that says a um, second of April, as well as these kind of national issues. Pardon. I said your PowerPoint's moved on to something oh, that says Earth fine. Day. The next That's day. fine. Okay. So this is just to this is just to say actually, as well as these national initiatives, think locally as well. We're thinking locally. In Croxley Green, um, we have a new group called Green Croxley, and it's actually led by the schools, led by all of the primary schools and the two secondary schools um, in the area and two of the churches are partnering with them my, my own church and an anglican church are partnering with them to try and raise up awareness not only amongst the school community uh, but also about uh, the wider community so on earth day in april this year we had a community-wide litter pick after school with uh, hundreds of people picking up litter uh, amongst our streets and our next plan in september is to join in with the climate coalition's a great big green week uh, and to do some other activities and i'll be going into the schools to do some classroom sessions about climate and the environment as well so there are opportunities here actually to go beyond our church communities to to kind of share with our wider local communities in concern for this issue and build relationships with people which i think will communicate something of uh, the message uh, that actually as christians we're concerned about the world we're concerned about god's creation which is gifted to us and that kind of gives us opportunities to share some of our faith as well so i apologize for the disaster of my powerpoint slides uh that's never happened to me before i don't know what i did um, but thanks for listening thanks for coming along um this final slide i hope you can see has got the buen facebook page uh, and also the the website and also the buen email address if you want to contact me but thanks for coming thanks for listening and i hope that's given you an idea of what we're trying to do uh, with buen across the baptist together movement there we go uh, and to welcome david uh, as our next speaker and i believe anna is going to 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 help as well to just describe um what the Climate Sundays in particular have done for Whitley, or the Climate Sunday has done for Whitley Bay, but you may have other things that you'd like to talk about in terms of what's going on at Whitley Bay Baptist Church. So uh, for the next 10 minutes, we'll hear from Whitley Bay Baptist Church. Thank you very much indeed. I, I wonder whether we could start with Anna. Anna, you're muted at the moment. You're muted. Um, because I think what, what Anna will have to say is, is in a sense more general and more sort of fundamental than you know dealing with the sort of specifics of climate someday so um, um if that's okay um uh, anna if you'd like to kick off no problem um so hello for those who don't know me i'm anna oh sorry <laughs> um, and i'm part of the climate creation care group from whitley bay baptist church um, and in June 2019, I attended the Time Is Now demonstration in London alongside several members from our church, including David. Um, and we talked to Sir Alan Campbell about, he was our local MP, about the worries of my generation and that not enough is being done by the government to combat climate change. Um, because I think, Dave, as you mentioned before as well, many young people in our generation are getting increasingly anxious about the future and that not enough is being done to combat climate change. Um, so what is our situation? There's obviously, like people mentioned before, animals, weather conditions, it's affecting everything with habitats and melting ice caps um, and things will get worse if we don't do anything about it especially with the extinction and the starvation of animals in floods and droughts. Um, and a verse which I believe really highlights our duty as Christians um, to take care of the planet can be found in Gen Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, which states, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And I really think this emphasises that God has told us to look after his creation and that it's our duty as Christians to be part and um, to talk about climate change and be part of the solution 
in our private lives through the way we live and eat and shop. Um, and we were just talking about that with Rachel and Jackie in our breakaway rooms that it's amazing obviously the church can change energy providers but it's also amazing that we can individually change people's lives in the sense that people can bring their own cups to church or just change their lives individually and I thought I'd just share as well a commentator from my in my bible um said a really good um had a really good idea of climate change how it relates to the bible so I thought I'd just read this these two three sentences and um, it just says after the flood God made a covenant with Noah that he would never again flood the world and that's a really important statement right at the start of the bible story that natural disasters are not acts of God um, but in our day we have committed violence to the planet and brought floods in ourselves and it's not as if we've set out to do so but simply the way we have lived in our western society and I think that's really true and compelling in the sense that we the way that we live in the west where really affect um, people in who live in third world countries are being affected by climate change the most even though they're paying the price for how we've lived so I think it's really important that we all in our individual individual churches take a play a part in embracing this topic and play a part in God's creation and also pray for a solution but be part of the solution as well in each of our congregations and um, like we were mentioning before I think um and David's gonna expand a bit on how we're going to do that um with our um services coming up to do with climate I think next so thank you for listening to me Oh, thank you, Anna. And I, I have to say, Anna's been a, Anna and her family, Anna particularly, but and her, her family have been a great encouragement to me, uh, to me personally, but also to our group in, in Whitby Bay. It's, they've, been, uh, they've been with us all the time for the past few years. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll talk, uh, I haven't got long, so I'll talk about the Climate Sunday Initiative. Um, this has been organized to alert us all to the International Climate Conference, known as COP26, of course, which is due to take place in Glasgow in November, and to equip us to prepare for that momentous event, potentially momentous event, by prayer and action. So this is a very special time indeed, potentially what we call a Kairos moment, a time of special opportunity and blessing for efforts to curb the terrible suffering which the climate crisis is already inflicting on those in absolute poverty, extreme poverty, and to ward off the monstrous threat it poses to all our children, grandchildren, and for generations to come. So then the whole Christian community is being called by the Baptist Union, Christian Aid, Tear Fund, and many others to come together and with one voice to call for decisive action on this, the, uh, the, the greatest moral and humanitarian challenge of our generation. And we must deal with it as such. We must take it as such, as something of that magnitude. And this is urgently needed. On Sunday worship on Radio 4 on the 7th of March, 19 year old. Ruth spoke of how confused and upset, her, her words incidentally, confused and upset she was by the failure of the church to respond to climate change. And she noted that according to a recent survey, 90% of Christian young people regard this as a serious issue, but only 10% think the church is paying enough attention to it. Now in 2005, the Make Poverty History campaign a wonderful time in my memory, I've got to admit, centered here in Britain and in which Christians took a major role, transformed the lives of countless millions of the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. And so may God grant that something comparable would take place this year. Now there's precious little point in a meeting like this one, for example, unless it leads on to something. 
And that's why Paul has rightly rounded off the program by posing the question, next steps? What will setting up an environmental hub in the Northeast involve? Similarly, in Whitney Bay, we've taken the view that our Climate Sunday, Climate Sundays, two of them, they do love me notwithstanding, uh, should be just the first step towards seriously committing ourselves to creation care, formally, publicly, and in practice. And this is exactly the point of the initiative. Its leaders say, our vision is to leave a lasting legacy of thousands of UK churches better equipped to address this critical issue as part of their normal discipleship and mission. Now to the nitty gritty. During their local Climate Sunday, to which they're invited to create, churches are invited to do one or more of three things. So you can do one or you can do two, you can do three, but all of them are of course important. First of all, hold a climate service, hold a climate focused service at any time before COP26 in November. Now, please make sure you register your service either in advance or retrospectively at www.climatesunday.org. It's really easy because then it will be counted and it, then you're, it will be cited in all the numbers. Please do so before the National Climate Sunday event in Glasgow Cathedral, which takes place on Sunday the 5th of September. So plan your service to take place before November, but register it by the 5th of September. So first of all, have a climate service. Secondly, commit. Make a commitment as a local church community to take long-term action to reduce your own greenhouse gas emissions. You can't do it all at once. I really don't know how we're going to go about doing some of it at Whitley Bay Baptist Church. I really don't know how they'll do that. But nevertheless, we have made a start already, and uh, that is that commitment. Thirdly, call. Join with other churches and wider societies, wider society by adding your name to a common call for the UK government to take much bolder action on climate change. And you know, the, the common call, which is the, the, the declaration by the Climate Coalition, it's motherhood and apple pie, but it's really good. You know, it's fairly simple and it's really good. If they do that, you know, most of our problems would be over, or at least on the way to being over. Then the culmination of the campaign will be the national event in Glasgow Cathedral on Sunday, the 5th of September, which will be held to pray for bold action and courageous leadership at COP26. And when the involvement of multitudes of churches that have participated, it's a thousand plus at present and building will be made known. Now, in finishing off, now is the time. In his first address to Parliament on the slave trade on the 12th of May, 1789, William Wilberforce stated that the nature and all the circumstances of this issue are now laid open to us. We can no longer plead ignorance. We can no longer evade it. We may spurn it. We may kick it out of our way but we cannot avoid seeing it because it is now brought so directly before our eyes. And so it is now with the environmental crisis. I quote, creation care is an urgent issue in today's world, says the evangelical theologian, Chris Wright. Only a willful blindness worse than any proverbial ostrich's head in the sand can ignore the facts of environmental destruction. To be unconcerned about is to be either desperately ignorant or irresponsibly callous. An article in Bioscience endorsed by 11,000 scientists uh, last year, two, two years ago, from, you know, said this, we declare clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency and that the world's people face untold suffering due to the climate crisis unless there are major transformation to global society. Well, let's all pray that those major transformations start in our churches. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, David. And thank you very much, Anna. It's great to have a young person as well um, contributing. And uh, for me, that, that reminds us as churches, we do need to listen to the voice of our young people who are often the most passionate about green issues uh, and, and take that voice seriously, because obviously uh, they, they will have to live with the consequences of what uh, the older generations have done uh, longer than we do. So it's so, so important to hear that voice and to give young people the opportunity to uh, to share that voice. And thank you, David, one of our elder statesmen who, who has uh, done so much for, for many, many uh, good causes uh, around uh, justice, uh, around poverty uh, and climate change in the Northeast. And we're going to be sorry to lose you for the Northeast, but may God bless you as you move down to Kent in the coming months. I'm going to move over to uh, welcome Cathy Clegg now. And Cathy is a uh, member at Stocksfield Baptist Church. And uh, Stocksfield is one of the churches that has enrolled with Arosha's Eco Church Initiative. So Cathy's going to tell us what the Eco Church Initiative is about and how uh, that's made a change at Stocksfield. Thank you very much, Cathy. Yeah, can I share my screen, please, Paul? Certainly. Let me just. Um, uh, while Paul is fixing that, um, I could say that uh, we started on this eco church scheme um, in, um, I think it was October 2019, which wasn't the best time in the world um, because the pandemic then hit. So it kind of made things stall a bit, but I can tell you what we tried to do. So you should be able to see um, a slide there that says eco church. Good. Right. So. Um, yeah, Eco Church is one of the things that I'd like to tell you about. And the other one that I will just mention briefly is um, the Climate Emergency Toolkit, which is something that has appeared more recently. Um, anyway, yeah, sorry, I just need to get my notes out of the way. This isn't my laptop. I'm, in case you've noticed me talking to somebody else, I'm babysitting this evening. I have grandchildren around and a cat and I'm using somebody else's laptop, but I'll do my best. Okay, so yeah, so here we go. Um, two things to talk about, the Eco Church scheme and the Climate Emergency Toolkit. Um, Eco Church is run by Arosha, which you, you probably know is a, a charity that, well, originally works in conservation and, and was very keen to work with communities and to encourage churches to get involved in caring for the world. Um, and so they developed Eco Church, which is an internet based award scheme. You can access it on any kind of uh, device and it's designed both to motivate churches and to resource them in caring for God's earth um, and to make it an integral part of what they do every day in their in their work and witness. Um, and it's run by um, Arosha in partnership with various sort of reputable organizations, churches, tier fund and so on. Um, so how does it work? Well, your church takes part in an online survey. Now, I know you can't see that. It's far too small on the screen. But um, the, the bit that I wanted to draw your attention to is this bit over here in the corner. Um, there are five sort of categories in this survey. And the idea is that you go through various aspects of the church's life and um, record what you're already doing. And then you get ideas for what else you could do. So to um, make that a bit clearer, I can show you the five headings. They, they cover pretty much everything that you might do as a church. So there's worship and teaching. Um, for example, in your worship, do you sing hymns about creation? Do you have sermons on creation care? That kind of thing. Um, there's management of your church buildings. If you have buildings, if you don't, then you don't have to do that bit, obviously. Um, and lots of practical suggestions about how you might be able to improve things. And, and they're not too idealistic. They do recognize that some of us live in in or not live but some of our churches are, um, inhabit buildings that are really very difficult to um, make eco-friendly similarly your church land if you have some they have ideas about that um, community and global engagement um, like the the list to pick along with the school but all sorts of ideas about how you could get involved with other groups um, and encourage them too we're, we're not in this alone I think that's quite important and then lifestyle personal lifestyle for the individuals in the church, um, lots and lots of ideas. So it covers all sorts of stuff, the songs that we sing, the food we serve, the energy we use, the ethics of the church's investments, the wildlife that might live in, our, in the land around our church, the water that flushes the loose, all this kind of thing. And lots and lots of ideas, lots of resources, including things like sermon outlines, youth materials, um, a lifestyle audit, so you can see where you are. Um, and here are some of the resources that they provide. And um, 
in our church, as I say, we started this um, in the autumn. So one of the, the first things we did was a harvest service and we produced our own resources that were based on what they suggested. So we had a, a, an item on food and some suggestions for individuals for what they might do. We looked forward to Christmas and suggested um, various things that you might consider in advance of Christmas, like um, how about getting some presents from charity shops if you can bear the thought, but why not actually? Um, the eco oh oh yes here and this is this was the, the what you would do for a big impact. There might be some other things to add to that actually, but those four are probably the most significant ways that an individual can can contribute to reducing their climate um, um, footprint. So this this eco survey is is freely available to all visitors to the eco church website. So you could go and have a look at it without committing yourself. But if you do want to take part, you need to register, which is very straightforward. And then your survey responses um, will be updated, and they'll, they'll save what you said the last time. And you collect points um, towards an eco church award. So that there are three levels. There's um, um, bronze, silver and gold. Now this church wouldn't have even made bronze yet because they're buildings, they don't score enough, although they're actually up to silver on, on land and up to bronze and some of the others. This one has silver right across the board and this one, although it's got some silver, is, is still on bronze because you do have to score on all the areas, you can't just be brilliant at one and, and rubbish at all the rest. Um, and when you've when you've finished one level, you can you get a certificate, and if you want to, you can get a nice plaque which is made from a recycled church pew, very appropriately. So, how would you sign up for this? Um, we just Google Eco Church, and and you'll find it. Or this is the actual um, link to the website. Um, and then I was going to say a little bit about the um, the climate emergency toolkit. Um, we're doing eco church, as I said, in our church, but because of the pandemic, things have really stalled rather. Um, and so we thought we, we just need something to kickstart this again. And we came across this toolkit, which is which is quite recent. Um, it's been developed by Tier Fund and various other denominations. Um, if you Google climate emergency toolkit, again, you'll find this. Um, and the idea of this is that it's to, so that your church can declare a climate emergency. You'll have come across the idea, I'm sure, that um, um, your local authority, local councils do this, and Newcastle University has, for example. It's quite a popular thing to do. You can declare a climate emergency or you can recognize the climate emergency or acknowledge it. it doesn't matter which um, form of words you use, that's for your church to decide. And then again, there's lots of advice and lots of resources. Oh, plenty of organizations that have um, uh, that are behind this, reputable organizations. And there are three stages. So you, you do some preparation. You have to get your church leaders on board. This is actually somewhere that we are struggling a little bit, but I think without that, it's it's hard to have enough credibility. It feels like your, your group that's doing this is just a sort of a splinter group. And you build a team with some interesting people. You prepare together. You try to take the congregation along with you if you possibly can. And you write a proposal. And then the next stage is that you make this declaration publicly. Um, and I won't go through this because we're, we're a bit short of time, but um, um, so you, you make this public declaration. And then um, what you do with it is you try to impact in all directions. So your impact can be upwards. So Stocksfield Baptist Church would try to feed back into the, the NBA. And um, really glad to hear about this, this um, when idea. Um, outwards, so that's um, other organisations that you, you may have contact with, it might be other churches around, um, everybody's contacts at work, in the community and so on. Alongside, sorry, that, that might be um, other churches or it might be organisations together with other like-minded groups. That has been an absolute whistle-stop tour. Um, and if I can see where it says stop share, I will try to do that. I will stop.